Good morning to you. It's good to see everyone today. Hope everyone's having a good day today. A little bit easier to get here today than it would have been last Sunday. Nice to see a little bit of snow, but it was nice to see it go as well. It's good to see everyone this morning. Also, it's good to see some back with us that have been out not feeling well and glad that you are improved to the point that you're able to be with us today. Have you ever noticed in studying the scriptures that God has never revealed one official name for himself? As we study through the scriptures, we find a multitude of different things that God is referred to, or shall we say, described by. But upon deeper examination, we find that these are not titles. These are simply words that are used to describe different attributes of God. And I'm of the opinion that the reason that God has not presented one official name for himself is because God understands man's tendency to idolize the unnecessary. And what I mean by that is because God wants us to worship him, to know him, to love him for what he is and what he does, not simply because of a name that he wears. For example, we see those today that have turned God into an idol in certain ways. For example, those of our Jehovah's Witness friends have turned the name Jehovah into an idol that they wear. And they use this term so much so that they downplay its religious significance. If you ever listen to them speak or, or even pick up the translation of the Bible that they have prepared, you see this term Jehovah over and over and over again, and it loses its significance over time. Likewise, there is a group that is sadly growing quite popular in the United States today known as the Kingdom of Yahweh, and they have done essentially the same thing. They have taken this Old Testament Hebrew designation of God, Yahweh, and they have claimed that this is the only scriptural name that God can be referred to. And they look at all of these other terms that we find, and many of these uh, have remained in their original language forms, terms such as God or El, Elohim, Lord, Adonai, Jehovah, and others. And they say, well, those were names of pagan gods. And they said that those pagan names were ones that were just carried over by those who were trying to pervert the purity of Jehovah or, in their case, Yahweh. Well, as children of God, as Christians, we wear the name of Christ. But in that, we wear that name proudly. We lift up the name of Christ, but we do not worship the name of Christ. We do not idolize the name of Christ. We praise him through our Christ-like living. This is the way that we honor Christ. But this morning, what I would like for us to do, I would like for us to go back into the Old Testament. And there is one of these designations of God that I think speaks a very important lesson to us today. And it comes to us from the passage that Brother Wayne read for us just a few moments ago from Exodus, the 15th chapter. Now, at the time that this has transpired, the children of Israel have been out of Egypt for less than a month. They have already witnessed God's power in many different ways. They saw this in the plagues that were rained down upon Egypt. They saw this in their deliverance from Egypt. They saw this in God's divine guidance with the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. They saw this in God protecting them from the Egyptian army by parting the Red Sea, by allowing them to cross over on dry ground, and then seeing God in his ultimate power close those waters back in and completely destroy the Israelite army. 
Well, after a short period of time of remaining there on the shore of the Red Sea, worshiping God and praising God, Moses leads them out into the wilderness of Shur. And they are there in this desert wilderness for three days. For three days, they have nothing to drink. Well, they finally come to a place called Marah. And they are so excited because when they show up at Marah, there's a fountain of water. Well, I can imagine this image of them running to this place, trying to get this water as fast as they can, but they get there and they taste of that water and they suddenly realize there's something wrong. The water was undrinkable. It was bitter. So bad that they could not drink this water. Well, they began to complain to Moses. Just as they had complained at the Red Sea, you've led us out here to die. Remember, they've been out of Egypt less than a month. They have witnessed so many instances where God has shown his power to them. But now here they are. They're thirsty. They think they're about to die from thirst. And they start crying out to Moses. Well, Moses does what he always does. He turns to God. And we notice in this passage that Wayne shared with us, beginning in verse 25, And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast in the waters, the tree, or the waters, were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance. And there he proved them and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. And they came to Elam. There were twelve wells of water and threescore and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. The Israelites were always worried about their physical health, always concerned about their physical condition so much that it caused them to overlook the fact that God was providing for them in many different ways. Here they were. They have become thirsty, and immediately they turn against Moses, and they turn against God. What are we going to do? We're all going to die because there's nothing out here for us to drink. Well, Moses turns to God. And God provides Moses with a way to rectify this situation. Now, there have been some in recent years that have tried to argue that this tree that was cast into the waters, that it wasn't really a tree, but that it was some type of plant that could be cast in that would sweeten the waters rather than it miraculously taking away the bitterness. They try to apply some type of a, a natural aspect to this. Folks, that's not what this is saying. What this is saying is that because Moses obeyed the Lord, because he did what God told him to do, then God made the bitter waters sweet. God provided this way. But not only in that, God also established a statute with the children of Israel. And he told them on that day, he said, if you will serve me, if you will be faithful to me, then I'm going to take care of you. I will protect you and guide you and provide for you so long as you are faithful to me. Well, there at the end of verse 26, we find our topic of study this morning. And the Hebrew word that is found in this verse has the literal translation, the God who heals you. God is speaking here to Moses and this statute that he has with the people. He says, if you will serve me, I will heal you. I will take care of you and provide for you. Now, in keeping with the context of this chapter, we find that what is explicitly being talked about here is their physical health. We know that he provided for them multiple times. He provided ways for them to have the nourishment of water. We know that he provided them with manna and with quail to eat. He provided for these physical necessities of life. 
But this verse does not refer just to the physical healing that God provides. But also in this, God is not saying that the Israelites would never get sick. God is not saying that the Israelites would never die. God is not saying that they would never have any type of physical infirmity whatsoever. But what he is promising them is a general good health. If they would serve him, then he would not place these, these diseases upon them that they were accustomed to back in Egypt. He was going to be with them and protect them in these ways. Now this term, this Hebrew term, it's found 60 times in the Old Testament. And in each one of these instances, it has to do with some type of healing taking place. In other places, it is, uh, it's defined by the terms repair, restore, or simply to make better. But we fail when we try to limit this just to physical healing. Certainly, we find in the scriptures many times when God miraculously healed those who were ill. We find instances where when Jesus was engaged in his earthly ministry, that he physically healed those who were ill. We find that the apostles, in continuing the ministry of Christ into the days of the kingdom, that there were times that they engaged in physical healing. But in this passage and in this verse, the God who heals us is not just a God of physical healing. There are times in this life when each and every one of us are in need of healing. And that could be physical, that could be emotional, it could be, emotion, or it could be moral, it could be in our relationships, but especially it's in a spiritual sense. There are times that we all need this healing. And we have the same promise that God made to Moses on that day. That if we will be faithful to God, then God will heal us. And this is what I want us to discuss for just a few minutes this morning. This concept of God healing us. When Jesus came to earth, part of his ministry, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, was to heal the physical infirmities of those that he came into contact with. But he did this not as a form of benevolence, but he did this as a form of evangelism, as a way to prove that he truly had the power of God within him, to prove his position as the Son of God. But then Jesus used this power also in many different ways that are not revealed to us. For John tells us in John 20, verses 30 and 31, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And then just prior to his ascension into heaven, he's come together with his apostles, those that were going to be the leaders in the church, and he established what we know today as the Great Commission. In Mark 16, beginning in verse 15, he said to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. But notice what he goes on to say. He says, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. So therefore, we find both during the ministry of Jesus and during the ministry of the apostles that physical healing was simply a catalyst to promote spiritual growth. This was something that was used to open people's eyes to the fact that this is the truth that they were hearing. That these people truly were inspired by God and that this message was what they needed to accept. It was not there simply as I mentioned a while ago, a form of benevolence. 
They didn't just go around and every person they found that was sick lay hands on them people and heal them. You remember in most instances they found those that were in, in a public setting or those whose infirmities were very well known. Why? Because that would open the people's eyes. The people would know that something had truly happened that had brought about a change in these people's lives, that those infirmities had been healed. But then we come into 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and Paul reveals for us that there would come a time that that type of healing would no longer be around. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 8 through 10, it says... Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall cease. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Or prophecies shall fail, but whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. But the question that we have to answer from that is, what is that which is perfect? Well, James chapter 1 and verse 25 tells us, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful doer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And so revealed to us that when God's full revelation, when the full revelation of his word has come to man, then the necessity of these things would no longer be there. That these things would cease and no longer be a part of the Christian age. Now with that being said, God still heals people today. But he does that in two ways. First, he does this through the skill of doctors and the benefit of medication. This is why whenever we know that someone or maybe ourselves we're going to be having surgery or some type of medical procedure, we pray that God will guide the hands of the doctors to use their skill, use their expertise to bring about that desired effect. But also, God has created many things, many natural things that have been proven to have medicinal effects. And we find that there is a growing popularity and a growing trend in the world today to use what's known as holistic or natural medications. Use the things that God has created to bring about healing in certain ways. But there is another way that God heals today. Folks, God has the ability to miraculously heal without any human intervention whatsoever. We probably all have heard stories or know people that possibly they were diagnosed with a terminal illness and then they went back to the doctor later on and that illness was gone. There had been no treatment, no surgery, no medication, nothing. What's the answer to that question? God decided to heal that person. That disease was taken away. Now, this was not done through some type of faith healer. This was not done because that person had an extraordinary level of faith that God blessed that person and does not bless others. We don't know the answer as to why God decides to heal some and does not heal all. We don't know the answer to that question. But what we do know is that God, through his infinite power, can do anything good that he determines to do. And if God decides that through that power that he is going to physically heal someone, he has the power to do so. But much more so than the physical healing that God is able to do, God is able to heal all spiritual infirmities. And this is the main thrust of what we need to focus upon today. Regardless of where we may be in our spiritual life, we may be headed down that terminal road that ends to spiritual death. Or we may be at a point in our spiritual life where we're suffering with some colds and flus of the faith that kind of have us slowed down and held back a little bit. Or it may be that we're doing well and we're healthy spiritually at this time. We all fall ill spiritually from time to time. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But consider Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14. In this passage, the Hebrew writer, he tells us the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, 
Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice on the cross, is able to take each and every one of us, regardless of where we are in our spiritual life. You know what? There may be someone here today who is still dead in their sins. Or there may be someone here today that is struggling spiritually in your faith. Or it may be that you examine yourself and you see you're doing pretty good in your spiritual life. There are still ways that God can heal us and make us stronger spiritually. He is able to cleanse our conscience and to set us on that path to where we can start doing these good deeds, these good works in service to God, to be pleasing to God. God did this because he wants us to go to heaven. He wants each and every person that he has ever created to be in heaven with him. Well, how do you know that? Because while each and every one of us were still dead in our sins, he sent his only son to die for us. While each and every one of us were destined for eternal damnation, God decided that this is not how it's going to be. I'm going to make a way that you can be healed from those spiritual maladies. And he did that through his son, Jesus Christ. But each and every one of us face times in this life when we are sin sick. When we sin and fall short of the glory of God. Well, we can praise the Lord that we serve a God of forgiveness. That when we become a child of God and we come into contact with the blood of Christ in the waters of baptism, all past sins are washed away. And from that point on, when we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Christ cleanses us of our sins. And what he is referring to there in John chapter 1 verses 5 through 10, he mentions three different dimensions of sin here in this passage. Notice this passage just briefly. It says, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So yes, in this passage we see three different dimensions of sin. The first of these is the one that denies sin. The one that believes that they are so perfect that they never sin. That they never do anything wrong. Well, very plainly, John tells us here that both Christian and non-Christian alike are capable of sinning. And if we claim that we do not sin... Not only are we a liar, but we're calling Jesus a liar. And that's not a position that any of us want to be in. But there's a second dimension to this as well. As we go through this life from time to time, we sin and fall short of the glory of God, and we don't realize we've done it. Those things that we've done that are, that are unwillful sins... We may say something that offends somebody and we may not realize what we've said. Or we may do some type of action that someone sees and it causes them to become weak. Or, it, or someone takes offense to something we've done. And we don't realize what we've done. These unwillful sins is what John is talking about here when he says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then the blood of Christ is going to cleanse us of our sins. If we are living a repentant life, trying our hardest to serve God, when we pray to God, we ask God to forgive, him of, to forgive us of our sins, then the blood of Christ is going to continue to cleanse us. But also in this, we see the one that is a willful sinner. And this is talking about the one who knows what's right, but decides to do what's wrong. 
The Hebrew writer gives us a very good description of this in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. He says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. What the Hebrew writer is telling us here is that when someone has become a child of God, when they have truly tried to live the Christian life, when they have enjoyed the blessings that are therein and they decide that they don't want to do that anymore and they want to live a life of sin, he says you cannot convert that person back. Notice in this it is not saying that God does not have the power or the willingness to forgive that person, but what it is saying is that when someone has seen how good it is to be a Christian and they decide they don't want it, chances are you're not going to change that person's mind. They're not going to come back because they've already seen what it's like to be a Christian and they've decided they don't want that. They want to go back into the world. And they become a willful sinner. But we must understand that forgiveness is always available to those who repent. Regardless of how heinous our past life may have been. If we repent of our sins, the Bible says that God is faithful and just to forgive us. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 said, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This morning on the radio, I talked about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. And we think about the kind of man that he was before Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And we think about just how sinful his life was, even though he thought what he was doing was right. Here was a man who he later in his life described as the chief of sinners. But yet, when he realized that what he was doing was wrong, when he repented of his sins and when he was baptized into Christ, he was forgiven. He was healed from those spiritual maladies. Another example that I could give you that is more modern day, some of you may have heard about this before, some of you may not have, but I know most of you have heard the name Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer is one of the most heinous serial killers that has ever been in the United States. Multiple, multiple young men were murdered by this man. But when he was in prison, there was a local congregation of the Lord's Church that was sending correspondence courses into the prison where he was. And he began studying those correspondence courses. And then he began to study with the local preacher in that congregation. And eventually, he became a child of God. He was baptized into Christ. And then before ultimately he would be murdered in prison, he actually began to preach the gospel there in that prison. Once again showing that regardless of how sin sick a person's life may be, God can turn it around. God can heal that person's soul and set them on a path that leads to heaven. And so this morning if you examine yourself and you see that your life is not headed in the direction that it needs to go, turn to God this morning. Follow his direction. And he will set you on that path. If you're not a child of God and you're lost in your sins, be made alive spiritually today by obeying the gospel. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then turn away from your sins. Come forward, confess that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and be baptized. Or if you are a child of God and you're going through a time of weakness in your life and you feel like that your faith is beginning to suffer, then be restored. Or maybe you feel that you've completely fallen away from the faith and you need to come back. Then we encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity today to get your life right with God. 
This morning, if you examine yourself and need to respond to the Lord's invitation, please come while we stand and sing.